Okay, so um, today we're going to look at the complicated problem of the use of violence in law enforcement. Um, so our focus on race, policing and violence really looks at the United States and is part of our international comparison. And you'll see a number of the issues dovetailing with our, um, our study on the use of private um, ownership of guns and patterns of violence and how the United States is really a, a bit of an anomaly in that it shows very high levels of patterns of violence in, 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 in a society which because of its socioeconomic structure might otherwise have been expected to be a society characterized by low levels of violence. Um, and this, is a, th this really links back to our, our study of guns, uh, private firearms. Okay, but a number of, 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 of big questions arise this week. And it's not just the question of um, the, the violence of the, of, the, of the police agencies in the United States. There's really a, a set of bigger underlying questions that we're trying to think about. Um, and some of these questions are firstly, in any society, what kinds of violence are allowed? Um, and this is an interesting question because normally we think that violence is bad. Um, we think that, uh, that, that all violent things are bad and all nonviolent things are good, but this, this is not the case. Um, there are two things that in any society, there are certain kinds of violence that are legal that there are no laws prohibiting those forms of violence. Um, and we need to think about what those are and why they are. And then there's another issue, which there, there are other forms of violence um, which might be illegal or might not be, but even if they are illegal, they in practice are tolerated or ignored or denied. Um, and there's certain things that are not seen as violent. Um, and as the course unfolds over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll try and think through this qu question even more deeply. Like what things do, do uh, 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 what forms of violence does a society allow, either in the sense of it, it doesn't criminalize them or it doesn't recognize them as being harmful, or it, there's, a, there's a kind of an agreement to ignore or deny that those things are even happening. And, and this is really quite common. And it really, and it becomes a big issue for us this week. Within that, and this is a little bit more of our focus today, the question of who is allowed to use violence? So this is an interesting question. If certain kinds of violence are allowed, is anyone allowed to use them or are only certain people? Um, and um, so the question of who is allowed to use violence, linked to that, who are they allowed to use it against? So for instance, um, one can look in, in, a, in a much smaller context, like within the, the, the space of the family. Some societies allow um, the use of violence um, within the family. They either allow the use of violence uh, between spouses, like, um, or they allow the use of violence against children. Um, and they don't criminalize them, and they explain them in terms of notions such as discipline. Um, and this varies um, across different societies and across different points in time. There's, they, they tend to be uh, quite big changes over, over recent decades into which of these are allowed and which aren't. Um, so we're saying that not all violence is seen as bad, not all violence is criminalized. Some people, some groups of people are given permission to, be, um, to exercise force over others. Um, and um, often, this is really interesting, the reason they're given permission to, 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 to use th those kinds of physical force is precisely because the intention is by allowing those people to use that, that, that physical force, we will prevent other people using other forms of violence that we might think of as being more harmful. And this is really the core of um, understanding the allocation of permission to be violent in society. Um, and to think about this, I mean, it's useful to go right back to the uh, sociologist Max Weber, um, who, who said that the state is precisely the community that claims the monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Okay, what does that quote mean? It means essentially what the state, what, the, what, what nations do, 
is in establishing them as nations, in establishing governments, they say we as the, 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 the governing entity of this, of this place give ourselves permission to use violence and we take that permission away from other people. Simply meaning uh, something like people can no longer just go and kill each other. People can't come into your house and murder you. That, 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 that um, right to use violence is taken away. But we, as the governing um, entity, will reserve to use the, the right to use violence. So if someone comes into your house, you can call our representatives. You can call the cops, and the cops will come, and they will try and stop the other people using violence against you. So by giving the police the right to use violence, we will protect you from the violence of other citizens. And if you remember, think back to Bowling for Columbine. You remember when they were um, interviewing the guns rights activists? Um, one of the, the, the interesting things that one of them said is that he said that, um, you know, when, 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 when you're under threat, um, why do you call the cops? Um, and he said, the reason they call them is because the cops have guns. Um, and, you, and, and, and implying that the reason you call the cops um, because the cops have guns is because that gives them the power to protect you against dangerous people. And of course, his conclusion from a gun uh, rights perspective on that was that, like he literally said, well, why don't you cut out the middleman? Why don't you just get the gun yourself and protect yourself in that way? Um, but in a society like Australia, we don't grant citizens the right to own guns to use in self-defense. Um, we do require that that that, that, that that use of violence is handed over to the state and that they can exercise that. Um, and and the states give themselves a power to, to um, use different forms of violence. For instance, capital punishment, the death penalty. Some countries uh, give themselves that right, some countries don't. Um, corporal punishment, some, some criminal justice systems use corporal punishment that a, that a beating is a, is a, is a legitimate um, judicial sentence that can be handed out. Um, some countries, and most notably the United States um, in the early 20th century, 21st century, gave themselves the right to use torture, which had previously um, been seen as, as, as something that was not acceptable for um, uh, any countries to use, but they granted themselves the legal right to use certain forms of torture under certain conditions, uh, a right that it was definitely not recognized by the international um, justice community. Um, and some countries um, give themselves the right to, to give certain permission pe to people to assault other people. So it really, it really differs. And these rights can either be official or they can be unofficial. So they can be in the official death penalty or they can be the unofficial practice of police um, assaulting suspects, torturing them. Uh, and there can be a complex interplay between what, is, what rights are officially claimed and acknowledged and what rights are covertly exercised and sometimes publicly denied, even while everyone knows that in fact they're happening. And so we tend to have this idea, this is kind of traditional uh, distinction between a democratic society and a, and a kind of totalitarian, tyrannical society. And in a democratic society, the government acts in the interests of all the citizens, the laws represent the interests of all the citizens, and thus the police represent uh, the, 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 the rights uh, of the citizens. The police are there to exercise through the democratic system um, this this um, role of protecting the public, upholding the law, and the and and by definition, upholding the law then should mean um, acting in the interests of all the citizens of the society, as opposed to tyrannical societies where typically governments keep themselves in power through the use of force. Typically, the police don't act in the public interest; they are a repressive political agency and typically very violent towards citizens. Um, as a way of controlling citizens, of a way of main, keeping an anti-democratic uh, system in power. And by anti-democratic, we mean precisely a, a, a political system that doesn't have the support 
of the majority of citizens. Okay, so we tend to have these ideas and we see examples. We see, um, you know, um, uh, um, as, as I'm recording uh, this lecture, Belarus has just um, had major um, uh, political uprisings with uh, very violent police repression. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a, a model we know. Um, and uh, it generally causes international political scandal when we see governments um, sending the police out to shoot um, their own civilians who are um, trying to um, protest to gain basic human rights. Um, but usually it's actually much more complicated than that. It's, it's the exception rather than the rule, perhaps, that the state acts in everyone's interests equally. That in fact, they tend, to, they tend to function in some people's interests more than others and some groups more than others. And the laws also tend to um, serve the interests of certain groups uh, more than others. And thus the upholding of those laws serves certain interests and not others. And, and, it, and it can be different interests at different times. For instance, um, often we see societies that are marginally democratic, but that particular subgroups within that society are denied representation human rights. So we, so, so we see minorities um, being targeted. We see sometimes even genocides. Um, we see the, um, the attacks on the Rohingya people uh, recently. Um, we see attacks on, on, against Kurdish people, but often, so it can be racial or ethnic minorities that, are, that aren't given full rights or targets of, of um, violent state power. It can be gender minorities. It can be, um, uh, in, in some cases, women don't have the same legal rights as men. The police defend the right of, of men to be violent towards women. In some cases, um, it's other gender minorities. It's, um, it's that gay people can't claim uh, full human rights um, and, and are, are not defended uh, often against, against violence from other citizens or against violence from the police. So the question of, of, of whose interests any particular police agency acts is really a deep question about whose interest is, is that um, society um, organized in, like the, the, and, and the forms of government, the forms of representation, the forms of law, whose interests do they serve? And, and so it's not just a simple matter of analyzing the, the personal motivations of particular police officers. We've also got to look at the social system in which the, the violent or nonviolent um, policing occurs. And our focus is really today just on the use of violence and specifically the, 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 the use of racial violence in the United States. So the question of police violence. And we must start by asking, is it worse for the police to be violent than for other people to be? Is it worse for the police to be violent against citizens than for other citizens to be, for them for citizens to be violent against each other? And I think most of us have an intuitive sense that it, that it is worse. Um, it's worse to have the cops assaulting you or killing members of your family than it is to have other members of society, precisely because the police are, are supposed to be who protects you. The police are supposed to be who, who makes society safe for, for everyone, theoretically. Um, not only that, um, but the police, of course, are the agency for holding people responsibility, responsible for and intervening in illegitimate uh, uses of violence. And if they aren't doing that, then no one else can do it. So, that, so, so where police are, are either giving permission or acting against the law in being violent against, um, against people, it's a much more dangerous um, situation than where other civilians are. Where, when, when just members of the public are, there's, there's mechanisms to intervene and to bring that to a halt. Those mechanisms are much more difficult in the case where those who are meant to be upholding the law are the ones who are harming people. Um, and here again, it's, it's, it's more complex. We need to look at the different levels. There's certain forms of violence that are officially permitted. 
you know, that, that most societies to some extent say if the police are under immediate threat, they are allowed to use violence in self-defense. So self-defense of violence is, is, an, is a common right granted to the police. But there's always a, de a, a, a degree of interpretation, like how threatened do they have to feel? Um, if someone is waving a stick at them, can they shoot them from 10 meters away? Um, if someone has opened fire on them and they can't, can, they can't hide from that fire, are they allowed to shoot back? So, and, and, and those are very different scenarios. They're different thresholds of, well, this constitutes uh, acceptable self-defensive uh, use of lethal force. Um, and so there's a question of what's officially permitted. There's also the quest of, question of what's unofficially permitted. So certain things that there may be rules saying, oh, the police aren't allowed to do that. But in reality, those rules are not enforced. Um, that they, that the, uh, the criminal justice system has no interest in prosecuting those offenses. Um, if they do prosecute them, um, they may do it in such a way that they in fact collaborate with the interests of the police rather than with marginalized social groups. Um, so, so it becomes the question of, 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 of what, what police violence there is, what is legally allowed and what is unofficially allowed. Um, and the specificity of that, um, it's often not, the, the police are not simply um, randomly violent towards everyone. So in repressive systems, they tend to be violent towards people who are, who are protesting against the government. They, they, they become violent towards uh, human rights activists. They become violent towards members of the political opposition. Um, they become violent towards people engaged in public protests. Um, and this really varies. So one of the questions we need to ask is, um, why are some police officers and some police networks violent and others are not? Because it's this, um, the notion that uh, all cops are bastards. This is, this is, this is, is in, in, in terms of this analysis, that's not a helpful notion um, because it doesn't differentiate between the, um, the situations in which police um, work to protect vulnerable people and those situations in which they, they, they work to harm vulnerable people. Um, what that phrase does point to, um, it has another kind of analytic history, um, which it shows that in corrupt systems, any person who enters into that role, any person who puts on that uniform within an already corrupt system necessarily becomes an agent of that injustice, whether they intend to or not. So, so that is a, that's a slightly different analysis, which we'll leave to the side. Um, but what it does point to is that in talking about police violence, there's often these two competing explanatory systems. And a lot of what I want to do today is to talk about um, competing explanatory systems um, and why we get different versions of things. And, 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 and here, one of the two, competing, the two competing explanatory systems is, well, is it the question of bad apples? Are there a few bad cops who are lawless, who, who are sadistic, who don't observe the, the, the rules of the, the country or, or, or of their profession? Or, or are there, in fact, toxic systems? Um, are there, in certain situations, forms of, of social organizations and that's forms of policing within those social organizations are in where the system is toxic and anyone entering it is likely to become part of that toxicity regardless of their own good intentions, good motivations. Um, and so there's a, a, either kind of a more individualistic, more psychological analysis um, of police brutality or a more systemic structural analysis. And, and those lead to different conclusions. Um, so we see this, this the, the, the one article that we read, uh, Confessions of a Former Bastard Cop, which, which is an insider's account of the, the police training system and practices in the United States. Um, and one of the big differences with the police training system is it's very, very limited. Um, whereas here you might uh, uh, complete a degree in criminology before you even, you know, think about joining um, the police services. There, you know, simple 12-week training is often more, more than required, um, all that is required. 
Um, and one of the things that the training consists of is a training in the sense of defending yourself against threat. Um, so really what the thing he talks about is those continual videos of police officers being attacked and having to retaliate. Um, and the sense that part of, part of the mindset that officers are being trained into is a paranoid frame of mind, a sense that, that they are continually under, in danger, continually under threat. And of course, this relates to a reality there, which is this, the, the mass of gun ownership and the problem of, of citizens um, being involved with gun violence. So, and, and, and this is one of the, the, the problems that, that in a society that allows widespread gun ownership actually makes it more dangerous for the police. Uh, the police are much more likely to, to, to be involved with shootouts and get shot than a society in which, you know, if, 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 if some sort of out of control person attacks the police, they might have a knife or they might have a stick or they might try to, to fight the police with their bare hands. Those are different scenarios to a, to a highly armed um, civilian uh, population. Um, um, and then this, this recurring phrase, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six, kind of, you know, the way these slogans kind of work to, to create a, a, a sense of a meaning. Okay, and what meaning the 12 being judged by is the, is, is, is the jury. I, I'd rather be judged by a jury of my peers uh, and, fa and have to account for why I used lethal force than be carried by six, i.e. be carried at my funeral in a coffin because I've been killed by, um, uh, uh, by a violent civilian. Okay, and that, that, and that slogan really captures the sense of, uh, the paranoid sense of being under attack. And, the, and that the training then becomes a training in, in, in defensive use of lethal force. And, and as opposed specifically to a training in de-escalation of violence. So what is missing is the, the, the absolutely critical function of de-escalating situations of violence. And what is provided is, is how, to, um, how to, to win situations of violence, how to be the person who isn't killed. In, in situations of escalating violence. Um, linked to that is also, of course, the, 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 not only the, the, the kind of mentality of the training, but the actual physical equipment of the training. And the question of, of, of the extent to, to which police should be armed, whether they should be, as a matter of course, carry lethal weapons, and what kinds of weapons. And the fact that when you, when, when you give someone certain equipment, when you give them the potential to exercise certain violence, you also normalize the possibility of them using that. So in certain countries, um, police are ordinarily not allowed to carry guns. They're not allowed to carry lethal weapons. Um, and that creates a different kind of policing versus countries where um, the police are not only carry side arms, but, but, but are highly militarized. Some, um, and and when, when one can visually see the difference in these kinds of policing. And often the, one of the, the marks of a totalitarian or repressive society is you, that the police look more like army than like police, that, they, they, that, 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 that their vehicles, their, their uniforms, the equipment they carry on their bodies actually looks like soldiers going into combat rather than looking like people who are going to intervene to solve problems in civilian contexts. Um, other factors that were, were he, he pointed to that, that were critical in the training was the real emphasis in protecting other officers and that overrides any kind of personal integrity. And he discovered that to his cost. That, that reporting other officers' offenses ended very badly for him. Um, and so the, the, the importance of not only the, the kind of paranoid sense of siege of the cops, but that the only people they have to, to, to protect them are each other. Therefore, not only do they protect themselves under kind of violent attack, they also protect themselves against legal prosecution. And so they, they, they conceal information, they lie for each other. Um, they, didn't, they, they give false versions of events when there's a, when there's a possible threat of prosecution. Um, and, and he contrasts that with the fact that most of their work, although some of their work does involve these violent confrontations, it's very, very little. And most of it, the time they're being called out to, 
you know, deal with things like um, homeless people uh, or, or, or minor disputes. Um, and what, what, they, what are really needed in those situations are social workers or mental health experts or, or people who could address the underlying problems. Um, but the police aren't trained to do that um, in that context. They simply are trained to forcibly arrest uh, and incarcerate people. So, so he links the, 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 the nature of the training program to this, this kind of increased risk um, of the police being involved with in, in, in acts of violence. Um, and one of the, the uh, features of, the, of the, the US system is that the, the police are allowed to lie to the public. The, the, the police are legally allowed to, 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 to make certain claims about evidence they have about rights the public do or don't have um, in order to um, coerce people into incriminating themselves. Um, and, and so a lot of his article is about the, the fact that it's in fact not rational to, to trust the police in a, in a situation where the police are legally allowed to deceive the public um, to try and incriminate them. Um, but that's not our focus. Our focus is on the use of, of, of force by the police and, and why, some, why some police organizations are very good at training police at, at de-escalation, training police on, on reducing the uh, emerging situations of violence and, and, and other police organizations tend to escalate the use of violence. Um, and that's really our critical question. Okay, so now I want to um, jump a little bit to um, look at the specific account of um, of, of a particular incident, um, but I'm going to end this video and do that in the second video.